Hey guys, this is Doug again with Fellowship of the Martyrs and LibertyDisasterRelief.com. We're doing another series, another another video in the pneumatology series. Pneuma, of course, uh, is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit, for the Spirit, and we're doing a study um, uh, of the Holy Spirit um, when He first showed up, what He does, and so on. Now, in this one, we're going to talk about what the Holy Spirit did after Pentecost. Uh, we talked in the last one about how the, the disciples got filled more than once. They got filled in Acts 2. They got also were filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts 4.31 and again in Acts 13.52. So clearly uh, uh, it's not just a one-time thing. And if your pastor tells you it is, then you need to ask him when was the last time he was all the way full. Um, we're, um, I'm running through a lot of the research that I already did a couple years ago when I wrote the, uh, the book called Who Neutered the Holy Spirit, which is available on the website for free. You can download it, um, print it off, or just read it online. There's also an audio book there where you can listen to me read the book. We're kind of walking through it uh, in a much faster way here, and then we're going to go beyond the Who Neutered the Holy Spirit book um, and talk about some of the stuff in the Rain Right Now Lord book. These are these are questions that I had to answer as I was coming from a Southern Baptist background where they leave off pretty much a whole lot of talking about the Holy Spirit. And um, when I said, "Okay, Lord, I don't, I'm not." I, the Pentecostals are over the top. The Baptists are leaving stuff out. Um, never mind the Catholics. Just you teach me. And I started doing just whatever I got to do so I can hear your voice and you can explain it to me. And he would send me to the Word and show me, okay, see how this connects to this and see how that theology can't be right because of this, 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 and this. And that theology can't be right because of this, 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 and this. But they're kind of right here and they're kind of right there, but they got, they're all broken up into pieces. Nobody can see the whole puzzle picture because they've all got their little puzzle pieces and they won't play well with others. So... Um, my goal has been to see the picture on the box. How is it supposed to look? And then we'll work on getting all the pieces where they belong so that we can make it look like the box. So what does the picture on the box look like? Well, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, the Lord had me write uh, a couple of books laying out all of the research that he had me do. Um, lots of Bible reading, lots of getting it in me, lots of listening to him, um, synthesize it all, and... Uh, which is what the Holy Spirit does, is lead us into all truth. Anyway, um, so let me talk to you about uh, uh, some of the people that got filled. The Biblically, uh, it says that we're filled with the Holy Spirit um, after the 120 that got filled in the upper room. Okay, in Acts 6, 30, in Acts 6 3 through 5, uh, there's a disagreement about the division of the food to the widows and the Gentile widows and the Jewish widows or whatever. And uh, Paul says to find seven deacons that are full of the Holy Spirit that can handle that. Now, we don't know if these seven were men that were in the upper room that were part of the 120 or were they in the first batch of 3,000 that got saved on the day of Pentecost and presumably they all got filled with the Holy Spirit or soon after. Um, but nonetheless, it mentions that, that these have to be guys that are full of the Holy Spirit. Um, Barnabas was either filled at Pentecost or soon after in Acts 11, uh, verse 24. Uh, we're not sure if he was one of the ones in the upper room, but um, clearly he was full of the Holy Spirit. The Samaritan believers who were saved but hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit in Acts 8, 15 to 20, Philip had gone down to Samaria to preach the gospel. Like we talked about in the last video, they got saved, they got baptized, but they weren't yet filled with the Holy Spirit until Peter and John went down, laid hands on them, and uh, they got full. Um, the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit when Ananias laid hands on him. That's in Acts 9, 17 and Acts 13, 9. The Gentiles in the house of Cornelius were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is an interesting one because they accepted the words that were spoken, got filled with the Holy Spirit, got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, were speaking in tongues, and then Peter says to the Jews that are with him, God poured out on them. Previous to this, it seems to have all been Jews. 
even though there were people from all different nations in Jerusalem at the time, when Peter in Acts 2 goes out on the porch, on the rooftop, and preaches his sermon, 3,000 get saved. Evidently, they're all Jews. Now, they may be from other nations, or they may be uh, Jews that have converted, but they're all Jews. The first time that we see uh, the Gentiles um, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, getting saved, is when uh, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. Now, the Samaritans are not exactly Jews, and the Jews certainly don't think the Samaritans are Jews, but they're kind of cousins, and uh, there's a little grace there. But, um, but this is a big deal for Peter to go in the house of a Gentile. If a Gentile eats off of one of your cups or drinks out of one of your glasses, you can't wash it good enough. You have to, you have to break it and throw it away. I mean, that's how, if, the, if a Gentile shadow touches you, you're unclean. Th that's how hated and how much racism, really, when you get right down to it, there was between the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, and for Paul to hear, for Peter, rather, to hear, I, I declared it clean, you go. And he goes into the home of a Gentile, preaches the gospel to them, they start speaking in tongues, and then are water baptized. So all of a sudden we got the order reversed, where people, people say, well, you can't, um, you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit until you're water baptized, because it's the water baptism that saves you. Well, here's a biblical example where that didn't happen. And you're going to have to show me a biblical reason why this is some kind of aberration that should be discounted. Um, <clears throat> that is to say, if you insist that um, no one is saved until they're water baptized, and no one can receive the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit until they're saved, then you've got a you've got a logical problem here because they just weren't water baptized and were speaking in tongues um, and had accepted the had accepted the Lord. It says so that they accepted the message. The Holy Spirit came on them. They were speaking in tongues, and Peter says, "Well, let's baptize them." I mean, how can we deny him baptism now? So it can't be the baptism that saves you if the Holy Spirit already got in them before they were water baptized. You know, uh, so anyway, again, if an asteroid hits the house before Peter dunks them, are they saved or not? They got the Holy Spirit in them. They accepted the message. How can they not be saved? Uh, another example is the believers in Ephesus, um, when Paul lays hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 19, 2 through 6. He goes into Ephesus, finds a dozen believers down by the river. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Anyway, so, <laughs> uh, and he says, uh, has the Holy Spirit come on you? And they're like, we didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And uh, what does that mean? And and he says, well, who baptized you? Well, we baptized in the baptism of John. He said, well, that's for repentance. Um, so he rebaptized them in the name of Jesus. And uh, they start speaking in tongues or prophesying or whatever. Um. Also, they may not be named exactly that we can point to a particular verse, but clearly there's evidence that people in city churches all over the place, like Rome and Corinth and other stuff, needed instruction about the gifts uh, because the gifts were operating there, which must mean that they had received the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, in fact, it was the norm. It was the expected norm. So there wasn't a lot of commentary about, oh, hey, so-and-so received, got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, started speaking in tongues, because there was an expectation that everybody would. They, that, this was the totality of their experience. They had no other baseline except this is what is supposed to happen to you. Um, anyway, I think later on, by the time Paul is talking in, in, to the Corinth church, I'm sorry, he, uh, by the time Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, uh, he says, do all speak in tongues? And, and the rhetorical answer is no, they don't all. But, but there's branches, denominations that want to insist that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved. Which then puts the burden on the person that the Lord doesn't give it to for whatever reason, um, and, and a constant condemnation that they're going to hell and that they're uh, incomplete and that whatever, and God doesn't love them because God won't give them the gift of tongues. When Paul right there implies clearly that not everybody speaks in tongues. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay. <coughs> Here's a list of some things that the Holy Spirit did after Pentecost. Okay? And I'd encourage you to just, you know, get a Bible out and read it yourself. Um, if you haven't already. But this is, some, this is pretty cool stuff. Okay? The Holy Spirit told Peter that Ananias and Sapphira had lied to him uh, in Acts chapter 5. Uh, the Holy Spirit talked to Philip and sent him to teach the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 29. The Holy Spirit picked up people and transported them elsewhere, namely Philip in Acts 8, 39, just like in the Old Testament with Elijah and others. Uh, the Holy Spirit comforted the churches in Acts 9, 31, gave Peter visions and talks to him in Acts 10, 19 and Acts 11, 12. The Holy Spirit told about a famine that was coming uh, to the prophet Agabus in Acts 11, 28. The Holy Spirit told other people to tell Paul things in Acts 22, uh, in Acts 21, 4. Um, uh, mighty signs and wonders were done by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 15, 19, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 4, Galatians 3, 5. Revealed deep mysteries of God to men. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 14, Ephesians 1, 17, Ephesians 3, 5. Dwelt within people. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Galatians 4, 6. Gave spiritual gifts to every person, 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, that means the Holy Spirit is in charge of the distribution of gifts, and everybody gets something. Uh, some people might get everything, but everybody gets something. Joins us all in Christ's body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 2 Corinthians 4, 13, Ephesians 2, 18, Ephesians 4, 4. Praise through our mouths directly to God. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Galatians 4, 6, Ephesians 6, 18, Jude 1, 20 to 21. Sings through us, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Gives liberty, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Changes us into the image of our Lord. I mean, that's cool. I mean, that's important, right? 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Makes us a temple for God, Ephesians 2, 22. Established church doctrine, the Holy Spirit did, Acts 15, 28. Strengthens us in our inner man, Ephesians 3, 16. The Holy Spirit spoke through Peter to the elders of Israel in Acts 4, 8, which got him whipped. Uh, gave Stephen a vision and gave strength to endure martyrdom. Stephen, the first martyr in Acts 7, 55. Restored Paul's vision, Acts 9, 17. Told Paul specifically about the last days in 1 Timothy 4, 1. Helps purify our souls and love the brethren. Helps us love the brethren, 1 Peter 1, 22. Gave John visions and interpretations and spoke to him. Revelations 1, 10, 4, 2, 14, 13. Sent messages to the churches. Revelation 2, 7, 11, 17, 29. Revelations 3, 6, 13, 22. The Holy Spirit will one day raise the two witnesses from the dead. Revelation 11, 11. The Holy Spirit calls out with the bride to all them that are hurt, thirsty. Revelation 22, 17. The Holy Spirit spoke specifically to the elders in Antioch to send out Paul and Barnabas as missionaries. Acts 13, 2 and 4. 2 through 4. Specifically forbid Paul from preaching in Asia at that moment. In Acts 16, 6. Told him, don't go there. Uh, wouldn't allow Paul to go to Bithynia in Acts 16, 17. Told Paul to expect persecution and bondage. Acts 20, 22 to 25. Made people speak in tongues and or prophesy. Acts 2, 4, Acts 10, 46, Acts 19, 6. The Holy Spirit assigns those who are to be servants and shepherds to the church. Okay, that's setting people into place, into their offices. Acts 20, 28. Warn Paul about the Tyrian disciples, uh, warn Paul through the Tyrian disciples not to go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, 4, which he ignored when anyway. Uh, spoke through Ab Agabus, warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, 11. Okay, this list above includes all of the nine manifestation gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, and then some. Uh, here's that quote, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God that worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, 
to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay, so the Holy Spirit powers all of that stuff. The juice to make those things work all comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives not only which one, but in how much quantity of each one to whoever he chooses. <coughs> and he never does anything except what he's told. Um, just to clarify, here's the nine manifestation gifts. Are here. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Okay? Now, there's a big chunk of uh, what's called Christianity that are what are called cessationists. They believe that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased and are no longer for today. That when the Bible was done being written, that um, now that which is perfect has come, meaning the Bible, and that which is in part is done away, and tongues cease, and whatever. And they believe that after about 8100, when, when the book of Revelation was written, that that was the end of the gifts, and they didn't show up anymore in the church. And they don't get... Um, they don't give you a lot of argument about why they believe that or how they exactly justify that, but um, basically they just they just want to shun um, tongues. Ultimately, it's about tongues and to some degree prophecy. Um, but they have to put a blanket across all of them because you can't exactly just eliminate those and uh, biblically have any ground to stand on. Um, but if you're going to say that we're in a different dispensation than the church age, that we don't have the authority that the apostles have, that we can't do greater things than Jesus uh, can, did and said we would do and all of that, then you have to come to the conclusion that the gifts of the Spirit aren't real and for today. Well, the thing is, um, which ones aren't real and for today? Uh, faith? Faith isn't real and for today? Now, faith is not just, I believe in Jesus. The supernatural gift of faith is something else. The supernatural gift of faith is what you have when you're burning at the stake and you preach for three hours while you're on fire and you don't feel any pain. Or you just know that you know that you know that God's going to take care of everything and you sell all you have, give to the poor, trust Him for everything. Okay, well, how, how is it we don't need that anymore? How is it that the Bible is here so we don't need that anymore? And through church history, how is it that you can look at people like, like in Fox's Book of Martyrs or Richard Wormbrandt, who's in a Romanian prison, or Brother Yun that escaped from China, or, or George Mueller, or all of these people, and uh, you know John Wesley, uh, and, and say that they weren't powered by a supernatural gift of faith, uh, a reckless, abandoned, complete trust in the Lord. Um, surely we still need that. Okay, well, what about uh, Word of Wisdom? Um, word of Wisdom is not just saying something wise. It's being given something from the Lord that is just so pure and so simple and perfect that it's just supernatural and everybody just marvels. Like, like when um, the two women come before Solomon and um, have an argument about that's my baby. No, that's my baby. And he says, you know what? Let's just cut the baby in half. You can each have half. And one says, yeah, let's do that. And the other one says, no, no, no. Give her the baby. I don't care. Just don't cut the baby in half. And the Lord says, she's the mom. Give her the baby. And even if she's not the real mom, she deserves to be the real mom. Give her the baby. And everybody marveled at the wisdom of just, uh, you know, cut the baby in half. Wow. That just, bam, settles it. Just like that. Um, do we not need word of wisdom anymore? Do we not have word of wisdom anymore? Are there really, sincerely, no one that you can point to in church history since AD 100 that spoke a word of wisdom, that, that had a, a kernel of something pure, that, you know, um, mangled up as he was? Did Martin Luther not see something, not have some kind of discernment, something to, to look at the situation and go, this isn't right? This doesn't jive. We gotta we gotta fight for this at the expense of whatever of our lives of our whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
What about discernment of spirits? Discernment of spirits is not seeing demons necessarily. Discernment of spirits is telling the difference between the good guys and the bad guys. Do we not need that anymore? Um, you know, <clears throat> what about um, tongues and interpretation of tongues? We have 3,000 language groups around the world that don't have a single word of the Bible in their language, um, that don't have any scripture materials <clears throat> in their language. Um, do we not need tongues uh, anymore? Do we not need interpretation of tongues for the messages for the messages being delivered to the church? <clears throat> if um, even if you decide that tongues is simply for linguistic evangelism to people groups where you don't know the language, but that doesn't matter because it's not real for today anyway. Well, that's just nonsense. I personally know people that God supernaturally gave them other languages. I know people that God supernaturally gave them gifts of music to just instantly sit down and be able to play something after that guy laid hands on them, and, and all of a sudden they're playing the drums like he does. Um, I know a lady in South Africa that God called her to preach uh, in English. She didn't speak English. And so she prayed, Lord, give me English. And the Lord gave her English. You know, you can you can call and talk to her. Look her up on the website. Ask for her testimony. And see whether you think that's real or not. Um, other people in other countries that uh, God gave them supernatural linguistic gifts. Um, as well as interpretation of tongues. Now, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not. Anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't think God is a respecter of persons. And I don't think, since we need all of these gifts, it says in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, I believe, that we need all of these gifts and all of these offices until the church comes into the unity of the faith. Well, we got 40,000 denominations. And we're as far from the unity of the faith as you can get. And, and we need all of these things manifesting, being used appropriately, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all knowing who they are, walking in their gifts, the manifestation gifts showing up. We need all of these things until we walk into the unity of the faith. And since we're not there, we must still need those. Since the enemy still has all their stuff, they got zombies and spells and curses and hexes and, and uh, witches and demons and Ouija boards and whatever. And everything they have is a cheap knockoff of whatever we have. Satan doesn't create anything. He just makes a, a, a cheap copy uh, trying to usurp it for himself. Well, if they still got their stuff, where's my stuff? If they got zombies, we have raised from the dead. If they have demons, we have angels. If they have spells, we have intercessory prayer. Uh, we have healing. We have wisdom. They have astral projection. We have taken to heaven in the flesh or in the spirit. I don't know. We, you know, they have um, levitation or whatever, uh, telekinesis. We've got Philip getting picked up and plopped anywhere in the world that, you know, just like that, powered by the Holy Spirit instead of by astral projection and soul force. We have the pure, perfect original, and they have the cheap knockoff that wears them out and sucks their life and destroys them. Ours is powered by the Holy Spirit, theirs is powered by soul force and demons. But if they've still got theirs, then how come we don't still have ours? That's where a cessationist argument just falls apart. Uh, that which is perfect is not the Bible. Jesus is that which is perfect. And when he comes, then everything, prophecies, tongues will cease. Because he'll be here taking care of everything and it won't be necessary. But uh, the Bible cannot be that which is perfect. You cannot say that this that we're seeing now, that uh, knowledge has ceased that that uh, all of it no that, that we are known as we are also known and that we stop seeing through a glass darkly and all of that stuff that says in first Corinthians 13 that can't be that can't be um, let me read you just some church history um, in 150 AD okay this is uh, this is uh, 50 years after presumably the book of Revelation is written Justin Martyr writes, uh, for the prophetical gifts remain with us even to this present time. That's dialogue with Trifo, chapter 82. He also says, Now it is possible to see amongst us women and men who possess gifts of the Spirit of God. 
That's chapter 28 from the same source. In 175 AD, Irenaeus, in his treatise against heresy, speaks of those who, through the Spirit, speak all kinds of languages. Okay, that's against heresies, book 2, chapter 4. That's 175 AD, and he's talking about contemporaries, not in the past. In 230 AD, Novatian said, This is he who places prophets in the churches, instructs teachers, directs tongues, give pow gives powers and healings, does wonderful works, often discrimination of spirits, affords powers of government, suggests counsels, and orders and arranges whatever other gifts there are of charismata, uh, and thus makes the Lord's church everywhere and in all perfected and complete. That's in Treatise Concerning the Trinity, chapter 29. In 340 AD, Hilary of Potier wrote, for God hath set same in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, next mighty works, among which are the healing of diseases, <coughs> the gifts of either speaking or interpreting diverse kinds of tongues. Clearly, these are the church's agents of ministry and work of whom the body of Christ consists, and God has ordained them. And that is from On the Trinity, Volume 8, Chapter 33. These early church writings, you can find them all on the internet somewhere, just do a search. In 390 A.D., Augustine of Hippo, in an expo exposition on Psalm 32, discusses a phenomenon contemporary to his time of those who sing in jubilation, singing the praises of God not in their own language, but in a manner that may not be confined by the limits of syllables. On Psalm 32, in Orationes in Salmos 32-2, Sermon 1-84. If you seek truth, you will find that the gifts are alive and in practice, both for evangelism and for personal edification. Um, speaking in tongues edifies the individual. And couldn't you use some more edifying? It's not just for evangelism. It's the Holy Spirit of God speaking through you to God, interceding for you, interceding for, the, for your world around you, interceding for the bride, all kinds of things. It is... Um, I just favorited a video recently on my YouTube channel of a uh, study in Philadelphia where they gave MRIs to people speaking in tongues. Now, when they did it with the Buddhist monks, when they did it with the Catholic nuns praying the rosary, the language center in their brain was activated. And uh, you could see on the MRI that uh, in their front cortex that the language centers were all working. Now, when they took people that were speaking in tongues, it didn't, it didn't activate their language centers. They weren't just repeating a single syllable over and over by memory. They, something else was going on. And the researchers didn't come to any conclusions. They can't, they can't uh, use the, those results to prove that God is real. But they could prove that something non-linguistic was coming out of that person's mouth. That is to say, something linguistic was coming out, but it wasn't engaging their language centers in their brain. Um, biblically, that's perfectly simple to answer. That's the Holy Spirit praying through you, and his language centers in his brain <laughs> can't be MRI'd. So if something else is speaking through you, uh, then it's not you. Um, the test for that is that <coughs> we can only engage the language centers once. So it's very difficult for us to concentrate on two or three things at the same time. If you're reading a book and somebody's talking to you, you're going to get pieces of one or the other or, or you know, just one. When I'm speaking in tongues, for example, it just, it just comes out of my mouth. And I don't particularly try to direct it. I can hold it in if, I, if, if I'm around people that's going to freak them out or the Lord says to. But I just let it run and I can write an email... Uh, do stuff, listen to somebody, listen to music, whatever, and, and my mouth is still going. I should not be able to write an email or, or read a passage of, of something with understanding while my mouth is going because my brain has to be making up those syllables or else it's not my brain at all. And uh, that's the thing um, with, uh, with the gift of tongues. <coughs> Um, we're going to, uh, that's enough for now. 
it's clear that there's a lot of stuff that the Holy Spirit does and can do, far more, I think, than we understand, far more than is really documented in the Scripture. Um, and, and, you know, I think John says that just the things that Jesus did that were powered by the Holy Spirit, if it was all to be written down in the three years of his ministry, there wouldn't be enough books, there wouldn't be enough pages and enough books to, to write it all down. How many times people were healed by the power of the Holy Spirit? How many times people heard from the Lord or were directed by God? Um, and so many other things. So, anyway, that's it for now. I want to create in you a hunger for more of the Holy Spirit. I want, I want you to see that however much you have, it's not enough. And not so that you can show off, not so that you can get a big ministry, not so that you can zap people and knock them down and have them lay on the floor and giggle, but because of because it is the Holy Spirit that drives you toward holiness. It is the Holy Spirit that transforms your nature, makes you a different person, and makes you conform to the image of Christ more and more as you submit to Him and uh, don't grieve Him. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. Um, more on this as we go through the series. The next one um, is going to be some of the promises of the Holy Spirit. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. More at fellowshipofthemartyrs.com.